<laughs> All right. Are we live yet? Are we live yet? We are live. So I'll take you guys for are we live? We are live. Um, I'm trying to figure out how we can introduce you guys. Either way, welcome to Uncle Bobby's virtual <laughs> author event. I'm Shani from Uncle Bobby's in Philly. And today we have the pleasure of hosting a great event tonight. We have Miss Deetra Price Dennis and we have Miss Yolanda Seely Ruiz. Um, they'll be joined in conversation with Dr. Ruha Benjamin to discuss their new book, Advancing Racial Literacies in Teacher Education, Activism for Equity and Digital Spaces. Of course, following the conversation, there will be a live Q&A, so make sure that you submit those questions using the Ask a Question module below. Thank you to our viewers and our panelists for spending time with us tonight. And if you're in Philly, in Germantown, don't forget to stop by and pick up your copy. But if you aren't, no worries. We have a <laughs> bookshop website that you can order the book from and have it sent straight to you. Does my mic sound like it's like an echo? Okay. You great. Now for a little bit about who we have with us tonight. Teacher Price Dennis is an associate professor of education at Teachers College, Columbia University. And Ms. Yolanda Seely Ruiz is an associate professor of English education at Teachers College, Columbia University. Dr. Ruha Benjamin is professor of African American studies at Princeton University, founding director of the Ida B. Wells Just Data Lab and author of the award-winning book, Race After Technology, Abolitionist Tools for the New Jim Code, among, any other, among many other publications. Her work investigates the social dimensions of science, medicine, and, and technology, with a focus on the relationship between innovation and inequity, health and justice, and power. For more information about Dr. Ruha, please visit www.ruhabenjamin.com. And with that, I'd like to introduce these three wonderful ladies that I have on screen with me already. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much for the introduction. And you know, it's my honor to be in conversation with my colleagues and just to celebrate this incredible accomplishment that comes at a very important time. Um, and so I, I would love to just kick things off and share a little bit of the behind the scenes the making of this book. What led to the creation of this, this labor of love? And who did you have in mind as your readers, as your audiences? Mm, beautiful. Deetra, do you want to take that or do you want me to start? Please start, sis, and I will jump right in. Okay. <laughs> First of all, thank you for that question. And uh, we have to give, uh, I think, props to a colleague at Teachers College Press. Dietra and I, we're sisters. We work in alignment with one another. But it was one particular um, session we were doing in the summer for reimagining education at Teachers College. And Dietra was talking about digital literacies, and I naturally was talking about racial literacies. And um, this person saw our presentation, and she said, I think you have a book there. So to be quite honest, we had never really seen like our work converging together, but when she mentioned it and we began conversation, it just made sense. So that's the quick backstory of it. In terms of who's the audience, our hearts are with teachers. Absolutely, we love our students. We work with superintendents and district leaders, but we wrote this book primarily for teachers and for teacher educators so that you know they can, they can get it right. Mm, Yoli, that is such a beautiful way to describe sort of the merging of our two worlds. Yolanda is in English education um, in the Department of Arts and Humanities. I am in math, science, and technology. And typically those fields don't kind of hang and collaborate, but we have been thinking together, I think for over a decade. Am I right? Okay. Okay. <laughs> over a decade. We started um, 
where we co-founded with our colleagues, Goldie Mohammed, Marcel Haddix, the Black Girls Literacy Collective, where we start really thinking about different types of literacy practices and issues that were happening with Black girls in schools. And so Yolanda and I have been in conversation around large scale issues and education. This is the first time we had an opportunity to start a different type of conversation um, around racial and digital literacy. So yeah, thank you for that question. Mm -hmm. And so if you could just now give us a peek inside the cover, uh, give us a sense of what to expect. Those I'm seeing in the chat, some people have already got theirs. Um, so how does the book contribute to the broader conversation on racial equity and justice and the way that this inequity is manifested or in digital spaces? Hmm. Deetra, I'm gonna let you take that one, if that's okay. Uh, and then I'll just kind of jump in with you. Okay, and I, I lost part of the last piece of that question. Um, sure. So, do you, do you mind repeating just that last part? <laughs> yeah, and then the way that um, racial equity and in, in, inequity is manifested or taken up in digital spaces. Uh, okay, thank you for that. So, one of the things I want to start by saying is the cover. Um, we were so fortunate to have our colleague at UConn, Dr. Grace Claire. Shout out to Grace Claire and anyone on this call, which so many of you probably know her. She is such a brilliant scholar, an incredible human being, just a thought. Just just a thoughtful person and obviously an intelligent, credible, credible artist. And she talked with us and thought with us about how we could represent the ideas in the book. So the cover um, really kind of grew out of Grace's ideas um, for what this book represents. So I just want to definitely make sure we give a shout out to our colleague and thank her for her contribution to the book cover. As far as how does the book actually take up some of the ideas of inequity and racial inequity, we really start thinking about all of the ways that racism is you know, manifesting itself in the lives of children and families and how that carries over into schools. And the ways that schools are often silent about these issues. Many of the teachers that we work with or the school districts we work with, they're really struggling around this notion still struggling around this notion of school as some type of neutral entity. And so really trying to help unpack that and let schools and let teachers and teacher educators know that, you know, school isn't a neutral space and that the topics and the ways that racism is encoded and that students and families are experiencing racism in socio-technical spaces carries over into the schoolyard. And for just one small example, this is also related to just racial trauma and racial violence. A couple of weeks ago, um, I saw on Twitter a tweet from a, a screenshot of a Snapchat <laughs> that was tweeted, I actually got embedded there. So a screenshot of a Snapchat, a snap that was tweeted um, from a middle school student sharing that he wanted to go to his school and enact, you know, some type of violence against the uh, black kids, then girls, then gays, and then Jewish children. And so this is circulating on his Snapchat. Really? Children are taking it up. Oh, Not, oh no, I'm so sorry. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. I wanted to take myself off of the screen so that you three can be in full conversation. So I'm gonna pause the video really quickly. I re I'm really, really sorry about this. I just wanted to make sure that all three of you are on the screen and my small screen isn't there. So give me one second. I'm gonna no pause problem. the uh, broadcast and I'll bring you guys right back on. Okay. okay. All right, one second. Don't lose track of your thought, D. Yeah, I love that. The more stories and examples, I think yeah. better. So definitely you might even start it up again. Um, when, when she starts, but okay. wondering why we were seeing, at least I was seeing the big Uncle Bobby's logo. I was thinking that too, but you know, you learn in this kind of Zoom land, right? Not to be disconnected. Exactly. I know you're just like, okay, things are spinning in circles and moving, but I'm just gonna keep talking. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. That, yeah, okay. so I'm, and um, well, I'm reading the chat, so can I just say that the one thing that is great about Zoom, when you have these frozen moments, folks are in the chat. So we just want to say thank you uh, to being with the three of us this evening. Um, I'm just sort of filling at this point, but can I take a moment to speak on behalf of uh, Dr. Price Dennis and I, when we knew we would be in conversation with you, Dr. Benjamin, uh, it really was a, a powerful moment for us. 
Um, we have been following your work with me more in terms of race and the work that you've been writing about and in, in, in doing uh, for so many years, in Dietra specifically around uh, the digital world and you bringing it together, it was so amazingly appropriate and such a beautiful honor for Uncle Bobby's to have you as the moderator. And it was a no brainer for me when they reached out. I was like, definitely. It, did, it didn't matter that this is like finals week. I was like, <laughs> no brainer because, and we'll get to this, I think in the conversation, just how much I'm appreciative of the, the work that you all put into this and the specific focus on teacher education to me, that's ground zero for anything we want to see change when it comes to race and technology. But I'll save my gushing for. <laughs> <laughs> but you have it absolutely right because, oh my gosh, we have so much work to do. And I, I'm hoping that everyone on the call tonight is wants to be a part of that work, right? Like we hope that we are, we're talking to like-minded folks who want to jump in and start figuring out, you know, how do we push these conversations forward yeah. in our teacher education programs, but also definitely in our K-12 schools. Mm -hmm. yeah. It looks yeah. like we're still live, and I still see the Uncle Bobby's sign. So I think you just have to, I think you just have to log off. But I don't know if that'll quit the the broadcast because you're the host. Yeah. Right. So what I'm trying to do is make sure that we get um, myself off of it. To there we go. Oh, no. Okay, we're shifting. Sure. We're shifting. That was Dr. Benjamin in, yeah. in full effect. Give me one second. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, Kate, for that comment. And while we're waiting, folks, feel free to add your ideas and experiences around this topic in the chat. Oh, look, we're all back. <laughs> thank you. And you can still feel free to do that. <laughs> uh, so, Dietra, if you can pick yeah, Dietra, you were telling us the story. Of oh, yeah. So, and of course, if you know me, I'm usually thought of as Dory because. I thought she's kind of fleeked through, but anyway, I'm gonna remember what I was saying. Sure. Um, was on Twitter, saw a tweet, which was a screenshot of Snapchat. And um, I'm assuming based on the information that was on in the tweet that it was a young white boy in a middle school saying that he was going to go to school and enact some form of racial violence or violence against in the order, black children or black students, girls, gay students, and then Jewish students. And the, the many things went through my mind because I actually did my, collected some of my dissertation at the school district. Mm -hmm. This school district is also located in a county that had um, the most people attend the insurrection. So there's just all these layered things that are happening when I see this tweet, mostly thinking about the children at the school and their safety and trying to figure out what my role is to communicate this with the school board and anyone I could find within the district. Um, but then I immediately, after that was settled, start to think if teachers aren't aware, if people aren't aware of the ways that children are being um, inundated with these types of messages in so you know in their social media spaces, in their social circles, um, then they go to school and let's just think think of this young man as Johnny. So some girl perhaps you know some black child perhaps some child at the intersection of all of those different um you know groups that were targeted might be asked to work with johnny in a small group after seeing this snap right so you see these things circulate in the space where your humanity is attacked where your safety is attacked and you go to school and you're expected to just leave that at the front door mm -hmm. and it can't be left at the front door mm -hmm. because students are trying to make sense of what they're experiencing and so part of this idea of bringing an awareness of the ways that racism is circulating in spaces that students are trying to navigate on their own and don't always have the skill set to navigate, the way it gets dismissed, depending on Johnny's proximity to whiteness and privilege and wealth, all of those things are happening at the same time. And then they show up at school. Mm -hmm. And that's where we need teachers, we need teacher education programs, we need everyone to start really thinking about how do these worlds intersect and what is our, what is our role? Um, our ethic, moral, and then just our role around equity and justice and making sure we're doing something about this so that students are prepared to sort of engage and live in a world and disrupt and dismantle a world that lets Johnny's behavior happen, right? So that's that's the big long-winded version. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, and so 
you know, my school, my public school here in Princeton, the high school in the last couple of years just uh, started offering after student activism and uh, a few teachers who were really supportive of racial literacy and justice class for, um, mm. for students as an elective. Um, and, you know, usually they take it as sophomores and the students have been trying to get it as a some kind of requirement so that you can't graduate. Like every so every student in Jersey has to have a financial literacy class. They're like, well, you need a racial literacy class or you can't get, you can't get. Yes. Um, but I'm thinking about that, that approach of focusing on racial literacy. Then I'm thinking about other kinds of um, programs and classes that are focused on digital literacy. What, what, why do you think that these two things need to be integrated and combined? Mm. In the digital, Yoli, I'll let you start off and then I'll jump in. <laughs> yeah, I think, well, first of all, I think certainly the digital end, you will do beautiful justice to that. But what I would say, Dr. Benjamin, is that they cannot be separated. You know, uh, I, when Dietra and I were in conversation a couple of weeks ago, we were saying that, you know, we have to get teachers to stop believing that technology is the carrot. So finish your work over here and then you can play with the iPad or then you can play with the computer. No, that is the curriculum. That is the centerpiece. And so what's most important for us is to understand that way before, teachers to understand way before remote learning, children were living their lives online. And so TikTok is not just about where they find belonging and fashion, fashion sense, it is also where they are coalescing it is where they are connecting with groups. It is where they are having an understanding about inequality and racism that they are experiencing in their friend groups or in the student groups. And so this bifurcation or this technology over here, education over here, that's not even a real question anymore. Uh, okay. Technology is so central to what we are doing in the classroom. And what you've done, Dr. Benjamin, you just talk about how central it is in our everyday lives. Well, mm -hmm. education is certainly part of our everyday lives. Not just, mm -hmm. it does, not just a part, but it is really where everything begins and ends. And so, you know, yeah. I, I am, you know, I'm, I'm grateful that you all are, are engaging my work, but I really think you've taken it to the next level and you're focusing us on really oh, wow. the ground zero for how we begin to see different relationships to both technology and race and identity. So I just want to just shout out and just encourage everyone, please get this book, mm -hmm. read it, engage it, teach with it. Um, and so I don't know if you wanted to add anything um, Deidre, before we- Yeah. Yeah, I, I think Yoli, that was such a beautiful way to kind of describe, you know, sort of the urgency. We're living through the urgency right now, right? The emergency remote learning, showed us all of the things, all of the fractures and in our infrastructure and in our pedagogy and our digital pedagogy, even in our, you know, a curricular imagination, like what could be possible. So all of those things are really exposed. But I guess I'd go back, I feel like way, way back to uh, beginning of grad school and really thinking about, you know, race as a social construct literacy is a social construct and a social practice and that those things are tethered to our culture and as we think about youth culture shifting and changing and being tied so much to what's happening in digital spaces we cannot not take it up right like if we are using terms like culturally responsive and culturally relevant and culturally sustaining the digital and racial have to be a part of that work. They have to sit side by side. We're not talking about replacements or add-ons. These are all part of the same tree that um, you know that we're really growing from, that we're thinking about. And, and I can't wait to see what comes next. But right now, if we just keep if we just think about it at that level, um, it's important for us to think about what's happening in youth culture and how do we show youth, um, particularly Black and Brown youth, that we we understand all of the brilliance that they are bringing into school spaces and how that shows up in their digital literacy. And especially when they're using those practices to um, really expose what they're experiencing in school around racism. I've learned so much by looking at their Instagrams, looking at memes, looking at TikTok videos, and also talking with them. But they're composing and they're producing messages. They see themselves as public intellectuals using particular platforms to get their message out. 
And there's so much for us to learn from them. There's a, such a deep appreciation that I bring to the skill sets that they have. And I'd like for teachers to recognize that and see it as a space to learn, but then also as a space to realize sometimes in K-12 education, the students, our students' abilities to, to kind of go all the way is flattened by the practices we ask them to participate in. And we we don't want them to, to you know experience flattened education. So if there's a way to think about their multimodal production and practices and to bring that in, particularly as we marry it around the activism they're having around anti-racism and equity, we need to do that work. So the book for me and for us is really a conversation like, so how do we get started, y'all? How do we start trying to think about doing that? Yeah. And may I add something as we talk about the book, to get into the book, there is a section we have, Say Their Names. And let mm -hmm. us remember that Dante Wright, Makia Bryant, yes. Adam Toledo, these were children. Yeah. These mm -hmm. were children that could have been students in teachers' classrooms. And our young students are seeing that death on their phone mm -hmm. all yeah. of the time. Mm -hmm. And so to not bring in what they are witnessing, what they are experiencing, and to make space for that within the classroom, I think is being irresponsible. And at some point, we're going to be irrelevant, right? If we're not going to understand how they're engaging with technology outside of the classroom, i.e. learning about themselves, seeing how people within their, their race, so-called racial group, gender group are being treated, and then you come into the, the school space, there's no discussion of what happened with Makia. There's no, uh, there's, there's no discussion whatsoever, yet they are witnessing and experiencing this right in the palm of their hands. Mm -hmm. So just from a very practical level, the way students are engaging with technology as it relates to the racial trauma that they're constantly exposed to. Yeah. Teachers have to understand that this is a reality. Mm -hmm. That is the minimum that we could be doing, absolutely. Yeah. And so thinking about this past year, assuming that you know, you, you, you've been thinking about these issues and bringing this together for us before the pandemic. And so given what students and teachers have experienced during the emergency uh, remote education, um, what would you recommend as the way forward? And also how, in, in, if at all, did your ideas change or evolve over this, uh, this year? and thinking about these issues. Teacher, I'm gonna let you handle that, but I'm gonna say this, quick, fast, and in a hurry, we found out a lot of things with the COVID. We found out that <laughs> we need standardized testing. Yep. And we found out the deep inequity, when people talk about a digital divide, mm -hmm. it's a digital mm -hmm. divide. We found out yeah. that students with various disabilities didn't even have the simple technology that they needed to do basic functions. And we found out in higher resource schools, not only did they have iPads and laptops and desktops, that in other communities, they didn't have not even one tool. Mm -hmm. And so I think what I learned and what I tried to ask teachers and superintendents to think about is, please don't emphasize on the loss, the learning loss. Let's yes. really talk about what we gained. We gained knowledge that the inequities are deep, so that you can now figure out how to ask for resources and how to bridge the canyon that you have been allowing to exist. So let's really talk about how we're going to move forward based on what we learn about what we always knew yes. that we know should be different. So that was my learning. Let's realize what we can do without and let's really talk about what we need desperately. That's an opportunity as we go in to education post COVID. Yeah, I love that Yoli. And I love the fact that you frame it as an opportunity because um, you know, early on, there was just so much discourse around everything being a failure and everything falling apart and this doesn't work. And you know, one of the things I kept saying, and I'm sure you all have said it a million times and heard it is that we are not experiencing online learning. I really don't even think we've yet to, to experience online learning collectively. We've experienced emergency remote education that yeah. really feels like a band-aid yeah. and we have like broken bones. <laughs> we, we don't have, a, um, and I say this, we as a collective, right? As a, as, a, as a collective, we don't have a very informed digital pedagogy. And a lot of that goes back to what we see happening 
um, in, you know, all of our systems, like, you know, teacher education system, our undergraduate system, our, you know, K-12 system. And so one of the things I, I'd love to see moving forward, I thought I would start to see now, but I still haven't, and I still have hope, is that we um, we can think about digital tools as being part of the learning process and not product oriented. So it's not that you write your paper and then you can make your PowerPoint and or and then you can do this other thing, but that the tool, just like every other tool, pencil, paper, crayons, markers, paint, um, I don't know, Play-Doh, whatever you want to dream of. These are all tools that you use to process and create content and make sure you have a full understanding of the, the point you want to make, the position you want to put out there in the world about something that matters to you. So that would be the first thing I hope we can carry forward or that we could start thinking about. How do we look at tools as part of the process and not just the end product? The second piece is what role does inquiry and should inquiry play? And where do students have opportunities to bring the questions that they care about into the classroom as part of the curriculum um, so that they are driving, you know, what we are, you know, focusing on. I, I, you know, I taught, I think, eight or nine years, I forget, now, in elementary school. And I tell people this all the time. There isn't one standard that a student, any question of a student of mine has ever said they wanted to study that we could not address. There just isn't, it doesn't exist. The standards are the floor, they're not the ceiling, they're not an excuse not to let students inquiry drive what's happening in the curriculum. And so students are at home. You know, I'm thinking of my child, Yoli, I'm thinking of Olivia. Our kids are at home and so here is this wonderful opportunity for the things that have nurtured them, the things that have grown, helped them grow into who they are, to let that be part of what happens in the curriculum. And, and I'll just give you a small example of how we could grow something like that if we're in partnership with teachers. And I would say that's the third piece. I really hope that parents, families, and teachers and schools are in a different type of partnership that doesn't feel so hierarchical. Um, but an example of that, my daughter had early in COVID, probably this time last year, I think, because um, I still didn't have a printer because Amazon, you know, had to prioritize who was getting what. And my printer just was not on top. Um, so somehow I had to figure out how to take an assignment she was asked to do in science, which was to document science of spring. And it was a print based activity, you know, write this down, write this down, write this down. And it was a worksheet. And I thought, she doesn't want to do this. I don't even want to help her do this. So I asked her what she wanted to do. And we talked through a few options and she decided she wanted to try to figure out how to capture some of the sounds she was hearing with the birds and the stream across the street in the park and to see the puddles and the leaves and all of the things. And we decided she would just make an Adobe Spark video. So she created this Adobe Start to Spark video that answered all the questions on the worksheet, um, but that was her way, her contribution of really trying to figure out how do I show how I see spring happening around me right now? Mm -hmm. And how can I do that in a way that lots of people get to see what I create, not just my teacher? So my teacher isn't really my only audience. And I think if we let students choose their tools and try to figure out their own way into it, they get to have a decision about the audience. I'm going to stop talking because, you know, I can keep going on and on and on about this, <laughs> but that is so important, I think, as we move forward, um, those, those, those points. I actually wanted to give a shout out and also ask, ask Dr. Benjamin a question in terms of Princeton and Princeton schools. So when you talk about moving beyond products, engaging students in the inquiry stance, uh, the development of their skills and their criticality and also partnership with teachers, here in New York City, uh, there is this CS, Computer Science for All. And so I wanna give a shout out to Christy Crawford and, and, and her colleagues because they really are working with various constituents to do exactly what you said, Deetra. And I wonder, Dr. Benjamin, in um, Princeton, or let's say in Princeton schools, is there something like a CS for all, a computer science for all kids across all grade levels? Hmm. You know, I'm, I'm not 100% sure, but I haven't encountered it. I had two mm -hmm. sons who just went through there. My, my uh, younger son is graduating in the next month. Um, but we came in middle school and we didn't encounter that. And so if it exists, it it didn't can come on our radar. Um, and so actually I see a question from Christy Crawford here in the oh, queue. Wonderful. Perfect timing. And I <laughs> encourage others in the audience in the chat, please drop questions. This is a wonderful mm -hmm. question. Christy asks, I'd like to hear how 
all of you see the book being used for computer science teachers, teachers who may think their purpose is just teaching code? Hmm. Oh, I love that question. <laughs> yeah, go for it, because I'm thinking about some of the examples that you have in the book, particularly. Well, so no, I'm just I'll I'll start us rolling only because I feel like that is the world. Christy, thank you for that question. I have been living it, um, particularly in thinking about you know integrating technology and especially with in elementary and really K six or K eight. I will be in conversations where it's about technology and integrating technology and digital literacies. And then I'll go to another group and it'll be about equity and anti-racism. And I, I've, I've written about this, these very siloed spaces where these conversations don't intersect. And I'm like, hey, we gotta talk to each other. Um, and this question really gets at the heart of, we can't have these siloed conversations anymore. All of this work is a part of the same thing. Like we're all working towards the same goals. If we're thinking about justice, equity, and liberation, we can't think about sending, teaching all of our students how to code and then sending them into spaces where they have like the Google manifesto written or all of the other things, right? So we can, we can talk about the to toxic, um, harmful environments, particularly that, you know, thinking of black girls as a black woman myself, we would be walking into if we are not thinking about that. And so anyway, I just want to start there and then pass the mic because I can't wait for this answer to keep growing. <laughs> No, I no, I feel that you you've you've touched it. I think we have to get away from binary thinking overall. Yeah. And I think that is what keeps us limited in our education system. It keeps us limited in our government. You know, when we think about parties, you're part of this party or part of that party. And I think we need to expand our vision. And that's really what we tried to do in this book, not only bring together you know, the racial and the digital, which is already there, right? We're just comment, offering commentary on what we've seen in our classrooms, what we yeah. hear from students. But I think we need to expand our thinking. And again, I, I know I keep pulling you into it, Dr. Benjamin, but that really is the work that you have been yeah. doing. You are having us expand our yeah. understanding of the technocratic, of technology, how it impacts our lives, particularly as racialized beings, whether it's from not being able to get soap out of a dispenser in a public space or the way that technology is used in the carceral state. Yes. So, I mean, it is our <laughs> lives. Let's stop with the bifurcated sort of binary thinking is this or that. And let's really see how our lives and, and things converge and start growing pedagogy and curriculum out of that conversion. Mm, yes. I, could, I couldn't agree more. And if there's any uh, question that I raise um, and you want to come back to with what, if something else comes to mind, please feel free. Um, and for those of us who aren't in the world of teacher education, I'm sure many people on the, on the call are, but for those who aren't, can you give us a sense of how race and technology is currently positioned in teacher ed and how does this book speak to some of the challenges and possibilities in this field, in this area? Detroit, please. Yeah, I, well, I selfishly <laughs> want to come back to the like thinking about technology coding and surveillance with Dr. Benjamin, but I will I will wait to another conversation. <laughs> well, I do think it has so many implications for education, particularly now that we are all online and the ways that platforms are being used. And anyway, I'm stop. I'll, I'll, I'll keep us going down that road, but I do want to, I hope we have time to talk about that a little bit we today will. too. Um, but right now, you know, overall, our teacher education force mir mirrors in some ways what we see in the K-12 space, mm -hmm. um, predominantly white, predominantly, um, you know, um, thinking of generation group, maybe, I guess, X and baby boomers for the most part with some millennials mixed in. And so, you know, we have people that have different proximities to their own digital literacy skills and practices, their own racial literacy skills and practices, and their, their own willingness to do that self-reflective work to think about what's needed to push the field forward. And so I have been fortunate enough to participate in teacher education in three different states, and it's been really helpful to see, um, you know, having been an administrator in a teacher education program in Ohio and then moving to Texas and working in teacher education and then being in New York, um, very, three different, very, very different systems. But um, 
what sets them apart is the willingness of the teacher education faculty to be willing to investigate their own programs. Again, the same thing we ask teachers to do, right? T thinking about what is our program doing well? Who are we preparing our graduates to go out and serve? How well are they you know, engaging those student populations, engaging those family families? What do we need to do different? Um, at the University of Texas at Austin, when I was there uh, many years ago, they had a technology initiative where every teacher education student had um, a device. Every For some reason it was Apple, I don't know <laughs> how that happened, but that was there before I got there. So all of the, te all of the students in my class all had Apple laptops. And so, um, you know, they were very supportive in us trying to think about if all of our students have Apple laptops, I assumed when I walked in, my job was to figure out what I need to do with them, <laughs> with these laptops, and how we are gonna engage this to help prepare them for what comes next. And so it was really, you know, fun to be able to go out into three or four different elementary schools around Austin and have my students embedded in those schools and do work really to kind of work with youth, but also to show teachers what's possible, but also to show my students what's possible and also to show the university what's possible. So very layered ways to work with different, um, you know, aspects of the community. I don't, I didn't see any of that when I came to New York. I'm not saying it's not happening, but I did not see that when I first came to New York. And I was very shocked that the teacher education programs were very much the Ivy Tower removed from what was happening other than sending students out into the field to do their student teaching. And so that would be one thing I would hope would change, that the folks who are in teacher education have a better understanding of what actually happens in the field. Um, it's still shocking to me how many colleagues or people I know that don't go out into schools, um, have not worked with young people in any capacity. And, and that is one thing we, we definitely should want to change so that the pedagogy and the curriculum that is growing out of teacher education programs is informed by what's happening in K-12 education, that you see that relationship um, and you see the tension because there's always gonna be a tension there, but you can see it and people accept it. Um, so that's, I'll, I'll start, start with that and Yoli, please build on. But I, I think that that's definitely one of the biggest problems I've seen is the lack of understanding of what's happening in K-12 spaces. And in my opinion, the lack of investment. And by investment, I mean, get yourself in the classroom, <laughs> show your students ways that they can work with the babies. Um, real basic stuff, right? But it, I didn't see that happening. You know, Deej, if I may add really quickly, thank you for that that kind of philosophical grounding, right, about how teacher education should position themselves. As I was listening to you, I was thinking on a practical level of technology and racial literacy. I would like to see teacher ed programs use technology in a way for teachers to do that self-work. Y'all know I often talk about this idea of archaeology of self. Mm -hmm. And actually, my colleague and I, Dr. Angela Costa, we are working with the place to create a digital tool for folks to do that kind of digital excavation mm -hmm. around their personal and their professional, what I call the, the six components. This is in the book as well. The six components of racial literacy development. So where does, how do you cultivate or uh, critical humility critical reflection, historical literacy. So we're trying to create a digital tool where folks can actually go in and almost create a, a microsite and keep track of their own racial literacy development. I would like to see those kinds of practical digital techno you know, use of technology in teacher education programs as we encourage teachers to do that self-work so that when they do go out into the field, Dietra, that they have done some self excavation around their biases, their racism, yes. their stereotypical thoughts about communities, you know, so that they will not ex continue to exact harm. And yes. education programs, we owe it. We owe it to our teacher ed candidates. We cannot continue to be afraid to have these conversations, to offend someone. The parent mm. will pay a lot of money, will get upset about it. We have to prepare people for the 21st century, both technologically and also being racially literate. That's what yes. I want to see. And you have, I love that. <laughs> you have, you know, the people on this call are like, yes, yesterday, let's do all of that. And so one of the recurring questions, and I get this too often when I'm speaking to people who are, who are on board, they're like, how do we 
make this mandatory? How do we make it so that it's not just an opt in? You know, here Destiny mm. saying in text in Austin, people can just opt out uh, of of trainings that you know they're not inclined to. And um, mm. another person here anonymously saying that they were at a PD two weeks ago and that this would have been perfect. But you know, if it's just and so I don't know if you have thoughts about. How so? It's not just speaking to those who are already inclined to to do this work. Mm, yeah. Beautiful question. I just want to say we need courageous leaders. Yes. And I feel really great about being in New York City. You know, she just started a couple of months ago, but Chancellor Misha Porter is really yeah. coming out, being very centered on families, centered on children, and you know, centered in some ways. I would say on and technology and, and other ways. We need courageous leaders. We need people, as Dr. Bettina Love would say, you know, to be co-conspirators and not be afraid to put something on the line. And yeah. then we need those leaders that will take on the work of, you know, Dr. Goldie Muhammad of cultivating genius and putting yeah. in a pedagogy that will cultivate the genius of our teachers and our um, and our students. People are living in fear because they're protecting themselves. They're protecting their paycheck and their little world. When you yeah. choose the world of education and to be an activist, you have to put something on the line. We need bold leaders, people who are afraid to say, I will try this. And we need a network so that people, one or two people, they're not kind of chosen and then you know they're isolated and they can be fired. So we need to really think about grassroots organizing in some ways for this. Yeah. But we need to have people at the table who are willing to say, okay, I'll put myself on the line for a greater cause. Mm, that's so powerful, Yoli. And you're absolutely right. And, and with that leadership, and you've already said the self-reflection piece, but the leadership, the self-reflection, and also the critical honesty. You know, I, I honestly am always shocked when I'm in a room with people where I know what's happening in their program and they're saying, oh, yeah, we're doing that. We're doing that. And then you hear their department chair or the dean or, you know, all the higher ups parrot. Oh, our program does that. Our program is we're social justice. Y'all don't know that. We are social justice. Like, and you're just sitting there like, mm, I don't think so. Or, you know, your experience. <laughs> right. It's like the co-opting of the words, but none of the commitment to the actual action. Yeah. And I, I think that as long as we allow that to happen, right, the cloaking to happen, then that's what's going to keep happening. So unless there's some critical honesty, some radical honesty about here's really what we what we do and this is what we need help with. So that also exposes the point that we need to be able to ask for help. We need to be able to say the things that we don't have the skills and practices, resources, capacity at this time for but are willing to grow and work towards. It, I, I talk about this a lot as a continuum. So it doesn't have to be an either or, it's just you're moving towards the something, right? The goal, whatever that is, whether it's engaging the sociopolitical, whether it's taking the sociopolitical with the digital, but but you need to start seeing where you, be, being honest about where you really are. Mm -hmm. And I think that helps us at least take a true assessment so that we can figure out, well, what can we do to help you? And we have several like, I think in the beginning, Yoli and I thought, let's make choose your own adventure things. If your program's doing here, follow this line and then go branch off and follow this line. And then I think we, we ended up making a graphic that didn't do all of that. But I was going <laughs> down all these, it was click fun, here and click that. But it was fun when we were designing it. We had a lot of fun. <laughs> it was a lot of fun. And but we wanted saying, people. <laughs> write with people you love, write with people you respect. Because yes. the academy can be so hard sometimes. And even for those of you in K through 12, teach with people you love, teach with people you respect. Don't be afraid to lift someone else up who's doing the work because you think it's going to take away from your shine. We yeah. need one another. And one thing I want to say, you know, Dr. Benjamin, is that doing this work with my sister, Dietra, it just gives me joy every time I show the, the front of the book and I say, I've done this with, you know, my sister friend, my colleague, yeah. it made all the difference in the world. And that has allowed us to even have this love to want to promote. We want everyone, every teacher to have this book in their hands, not because we're trying to sell books, but we really feel we're offering something. Yes. When people need something tangible, what yes. they can do tomorrow. And we feel that that's in this book. 
Well, mm. joy is infectious. <laughs> I will say. <laughs> So if anyone needs some joy in their life, certainly the process that you went through to create this, it totally comes out in the work and I think in people who, who actually engage it. We have a question here from Sam Cole, and I can imagine others perhaps who are more comfortable on the racial literacy side of things who feel a little nervous or ambivalent about the digital space thing. <laughs> and so Sam asks, what technological skills, aside from the basics, do you think scholars need to integrate racial literacy and technology in schools? Teacher, mm. that's, <laughs> that's a good one. <laughs> well, look, that's all of us. We'll just all jump on and <laughs> start great. talking about that. Mm. You know, here's where I always start when people ask me that. And I know, Yoli, you'll make fun of me. And if my daughter's on this call, she'll make fun of me after. But you know how I am about Star Wars and Harry Potter and <laughs> all my fantasy books. You have to want to play and have a playful imagination. Mm -hmm. And if you are approaching any of this work, race, technology, and I guess I'm speaking a little bit more about technology, but you have to have an openness and an openness to play, an openness for your computer screen to fail. I mean, you watched the three of us when we weren't all on the screen together. We just kept talking. I wasn't gonna make a cup of tea or a glass of wine, depending how long we were waiting, but we're gonna keep moving because <laughs> the technology can't change what we, are, what we wanna do. Mm -hmm. And so have a plan A, have a plan B, have a plan C, right? So instead of our linear thinking, like this free flowing, I don't know if any of you all remember Prezi, it gave me a headache every time yeah. I watched him, but you know how there's all the loops and the loops. Yeah. That's how I would say bring that type of flexible approach um, to wanting to, to play and explore and to see what's possible. And also position yourself as a learner at all time mm -hmm. with all of the people you're learning with. So if I'm working with, you know, second graders like I was last year, we are all trying to figure this thing out. Even if I might know more about the thing, being open to what they could show me every single time I learn something new. I'm like, man, I didn't know the screen could do that. I didn't know that you could do, and I really didn't. And so it's just this openness, okay? I'm, and I'll stop because it does make me happy to talk about this question because I think, that that ability to be imaginative, to play, to think about what could be if I tried this thing, that is what allows us to bring all the tools to the table and let our students create. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think our fear and our ego get in the way. You know, we mm. feel like, you know, as an adult, unless you have a relationship with the students, you, that's where critical humility comes into. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's what you said. You have to allow them to teach you. I am a student always with my daughter who's 16 and who can move around apps and platforms in ways that I honestly don't spend that time doing. So when she wants to show me something, I sit and I am the student. But sometimes our ego feeling, you know, I, I went to so-and-so school and I've been a teacher for 20 years. Yes, it's not taking away from what you know, but knowledge is always evolving and moving. And it's usually the young people that are, you know, kind of cultivating the knowledge that is now. So be humble. Yes. Be open. Don't be afraid. Now and I let the students know. <laughs> oh, sorry, Ma. No, no, go ahead. <laughs> no, and I was just going to say, let the students know that part of what makes this work fun is the problem posing, the trying to figure out how to solve the problem and not letting, you know, your ego be the problem, but you know what, Yoli, I can't figure out how to spotlight somebody on Zoom. Let's all play around with it and see who can, you know, let's see who can figure this out first. And then, you know, what did you do? Show, oh, you got it this way, you got it this way, you got it this way, right? So then you start building collective knowledge about the problem, which also helps our students see, A, we can work together to figure things out. You don't have to do it all by yourself. You don't have to suffer in silence. Technology is not the enemy, although there are some problematic things. Technology mm -hmm. also is not the solution, but it is a thing. It is a tool we use, just like our fork. It gets something done. And <laughs> so like, how do, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> okay. Yes. That was not planned, y'all. <laughs> you know my point is it's a tool. Um, and it has a usefulness and a functionality. And so let's think about how to leverage that to get the work done that we need to do in a way that's collaborative and collective and thinking about solving problems. Yeah, I love that. So we, we have about 10 minutes left and I see one or two great questions that I want to come to. But first, I want to 
um, give a little thought experiment to get your expertise after working on this book, how you would advise this scenario. So I just read a, a paper um, by a colleague who uh, did about 18 months of field work in a high school in uh, South LA and predominantly black and Latinx high school. And it was one of these uh, schools that had uh, devices for every student. Um, and there was two things that struck me about his paper. Um, and by the way, his name is Roderick Crooks and he works on human computer interaction for those mm -hmm. who might wanna look it up. But okay. two things that struck me, one is kind of going back to Dietra's point about students really being essential to the day-to-day -day workings of these devices. Like without the group of student workers who are signed up as these kind of technology officers, these devices would not be well integrated into any of the classes because they were always troubleshooting. Yeah. But one of the things he observed was that they were they often lost learning time because they were called in to do different kind of troubleshooting, okay? And, and they were unpaid, but, and so on one level, when he first started noticing that they were so essential, but kind of unpaid workers in this whole ecosystem, he was kind of, the way that he writes about it, it, it unnerved him, like there's something wrong here. But when he mm -hmm. had a town hall with the students, he was surprised that they were like, no, I like it, I have status, I'm getting skills. So they were much more positive about that element of it than he was initially. The other thing about the paper, which, and you can feel free to respond to any of the above. Mm -hmm. He has a picture in the paper of a, an iPad and it has a rubber band around it because it's kind of like a rubber band lock and a note that says iPad detention. The students mm -hmm. have their iPads with them everywhere that they go in the school. And if they use it in unauthorized ways, they have this iPad detention where they still have to carry it, but it has this rubber band around it. And so it's, mm. it's, to me, what strikes me, and it goes back to, you know, the, the, the brief conversation, the brief mention about the way that carceral logics intersect with schooling, is that the introduction of these devices also produces new opportunities for punishment. Yes. So it's a dynamic where we're giving access but I like to remind us that when we have access to something, it has access to us. Mm. So also, yeah. We're getting punished, but also the data, what he notices is that the introduction of these laptops doesn't change instruction dramatically, but it does allow the administration to keep tabs and surveil students in yes. very much more effective ways. So again, thinking about the different elements of this particular school, which may have you know, implications elsewhere in terms of data, data privacy, in terms of punishment. Mm -hmm. I just wonder, imagine my, I'm a teacher in this school <laughs> and I picked up your book. How, how could I begin to think about what I'm observing in, in all of these interactions? Mm. First of all, that's brilliant and layered and, and actually you beautifully kind of, uh, I, we had a question for you, but you sort of tapped in um, on like carceral and so forth. I, I'm just wondering a couple of things. I'm wondering about the predominance of uh, the racial makeup of the students. Black and Latin. Yeah. I'm, I'm yeah. wondering about the racial makeup of the teachers because we know how we can replicate those same systems even when it seems to be this freedom, freedom of technology when we're talking about black and brown children. So first and foremost, that would be my first question. I would think I wanna know a little bit more. And if indeed they are mostly black and brown children, then um, you know the same thing would apply with the things I talk about in terms of racial literacy and the punitive ways you know, that we uh, take things away from children or if they come in with a hoodie or a hat, how we have these, po these zero tolerance policies. It is, we gotta call it what it is. You, you might be centering technology, but you're still doing the same panopt, what is it, panopticism? Panopticon, mm -hmm. Or still uh, having a zero tolerance policy. You're still trying to control the bodies of black and brown children. So I, the same thing that I would say if technology were not centered, those same recommendations I would, um, I would give. But that's my limitation, Deetra, I, I, I know in terms of the digital. Yeah, I really appreciate that, and and I've had experience with the first the first example, 
when I tried to start um, a digital literacy technology club at an elementary school with fifth, fourth and fifth graders in the Bronx, is that we recognized we were spending so much time, even though there was lots of play, but there was a lot of time spent on instructing on how to, how to. And what the reason why we even created the club is that I was doing a research project with one of the teachers and that was taking up a lot of instruction time. And so then even trying to think about, okay, we could have this text squad and we can make sure that someone at each table or each group has been a member of the tech squad, but then it also limited who was gaining those skills um, because it took a lot of time to help get a group of kids, you know, at, at a space where they can be nimble enough to move across platforms. And what I also would say is we want, just like we want to have that type of digital literacy where we know which platform has which affordances for what task we want to complete and how to troubleshoot around that, even if it's not, nitty gritty troubleshoot, the big picture troubleshoot, we want our students to be able to, to be able to map those same affordances on the tools that they use. And so we don't want to create a system where, and often this didn't happen in this school, but it has happened a lot where often the kids labeled as gifted and talented get to be the tech squad. So then they, you end up creating this hierarchy in your school where certain kids are getting these particular practices and not everybody. So I think a more community justice oriented approach would say everyone needs that, which is where the tech club grew out of. But I didn't solve that. I, didn't, I don't even want to try to pretend like I solved that problem. I just can relate to it. Yes. And I think that this, this opportunity for everyone to be able to play and grow and think and create a space that is, you know, more immersive and fun um, was our solution, but it didn't, it didn't solve everything. And it certainly didn't address if everyone couldn't stay after school an hour and participate. And to the first que second part of the question, I am really struggling with this as a parent. And I don't know if any other folks on this call are parents. Um, I'm also struggling with it as a professor. And for the past few years, I have realized my students don't know what data is collected, collected about them in these LMS systems. So I white out all the stuff and bl black out all the things and show them, like, I see how many hours you've been on Canvas. I see how many clicks, how many pages you viewed. I see how much time you spent. It doesn't tell me anything about what you learned. If I'm using Flipgrid, it gives me this count of engagement hours. What does that mean? What does that mean? Because I can put my Flipgrid on and watch Star Wars. Okay. So like, right? So like, what does that mean? And then I get emails and no shade. I don't think she's on the call. So I'm not going to even say anything, but no shade to my daughter's teacher right now. But I keep getting these emails about how much time she's spending on Alex and PLP. And I'm like, I don't care if she spent 20 minutes doing Alex and PLP. Tell me if she's not learning something. Like, I want you to talk to me about her learning. So it's my frustration as a parent is what you're hearing right now, but it's a Formed by this notion that where are we talking about learning? All of these things are about surveillance. I'm looking at how many clicks, how many times you've opened something, how long you've stayed on the page. I have no idea what you learned. I have no idea what questions you have. I don't have no idea what you're struggling with. I don't know anything else. And so it's set up, the dashboards are set up to be surveillance based. And so the only thing they translate into is either a grade or punishment. And there isn't a conversation right now, which we desperately need to have, where parents and teachers and administrators and school boards are talking about, how are you using this data? Like, what, are, what does this translate to? What is three hours, five clicks, six pages translate into? Yeah. And if it's translating into something, who said that that's the thing it needs to translate into? So I have more questions, Dr. Benjamin, than I have answers, and I have lots of frustration. Yes. But I hope that that frustration turns into conversations with people so we could start unpacking it. And I know folks at NYU, and you probably are engaging in this work in some place, in some ways too, are, are looking at dashboards and building different dashboards and trying to work with um, faculty to create dashboards. And I've even played a little bit on the periphery of this with my colleague, Charles Lang, but it is... Um, it is a great source of frustration given where we are right now in emergency world where most of what we're doing is technology mediated. And so if we end on Zoom, we all could ask ourselves or Crowdcast, what does the dashboard look like for Crowdcast, right? Like what has been collected about us? And, and that would be a very interesting thing to know. Definitely true, that is true. Not to not, so <laughs> not to end with like scary okay. doom and gloom. <laughs> I thought we're just getting started. Can I say, Dr. Ruha Benjamin, we can hang out with you 
Let's do wow. it. I'm down the street. <laughs> yeah. Let's do it. Thank Listen, you. I know we have time. I just wanted to say you know, thank you. We are so honored. Uh, and I want to encourage everyone, if you're getting your copy, if you still have to get your copy, get it through Uncle Bobby's. And I'll turn it back over to our wonderful host. Hello, everybody. That conversation, I wish that y'all were teaching me when I <laughs> because, man, but thank you so, 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 so much for being here with us tonight. If you guys have not gotten your books, make sure that you either head down to Uncle Bobby's. I'll be there um, <laughs> so that you guys can pick up your books when it comes out, of course. And thank you so much again for this amazing conversation. I can't thank you ladies enough. Um, I do hope that everybody me, I was about to say, gets home safely. Or have a good evening, Dr. Benjamin. Thank you so much for just the questions, pushing our thinking um, for all of the work that you do in this field that has inspired us and will continue to inspire us. I know we both would love to be in conversation with you again. To everyone on the call, thank you so much for taking an hour out of your life. And for those of you who've been on Zoom all day, thank you for, again, joining us on another, another virtual space. We are so grateful to, again, offer this book as a conversation starter and to see where it goes. So thank you. Thank you. Bye, good night, everyone. And Yoli, sending love. I love you, Deetra. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs>